Good afternoon, everyone. It looks like it's three o'clock. Uh, thank you all for joining our webinar on Ontario's new math curriculum through Brightspace. My name is Kim French and I am the K-12 content partner here at D2L. So D2L's mission is to transform the way the world learns, which is why we've partnered with Ontario-based Bayfield Design to develop curriculum-based content specifically for the Ontario curriculum, as well as Fair Chance Learning who partner with school boards to provide customized professional learning um, that helps teachers optimize technology and content, both in blended and online environments and helps maximize student engagement and success. During this webinar, my colleague Barb Seaton at Fair Chance Learning will discuss the um, Ontario's new math curriculum and some of the changes to it. Next, I'll give you a demo of the grade three math course, which is one of the eight courses included in our math course pack. I just wanted to mention that all of our courses have been designed to meet the expectations of Ontario's new math curriculum, which was released in July of 2020. And our grade three course has already been approved on the Trillium list. We're expecting to hear back from the remaining seven courses any day. After the demo, I will ask a few questions to Naomi Weller. Uh, she is a teacher in the Hamilton Wentworth District School Board that had the opportunity to pilot our math content over the summer. So she's going to share some of her feedback on the content. Uh, she'll discuss how she used the content to guide some of her synchronous instruction with her remote students, as well as share some, um, some experience about how she could incorporate the content into a blended environment as well. We will leave a few minutes at the end of the webinar to answer some questions from the audience. So we'll be collecting questions throughout the webinar um, and please input them in the Q&A feature in Zoom uh, so that we can capture those and, and address as many as we can at the end. Finally, um, I know that there were a lot of teachers and a lot of educators who really wanted to attend today's webinar and they just weren't able to make it. So we will be recording this webinar and we will be sending a link out to all of our participants so you guys can share it with any of your colleagues. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce you to Barb with Fair Chance Learning, who's gonna kick us off by discussing Ontario's new math curriculum. Thanks, Kim, that's an awesome introduction. And if I could steal the screen, that would be wonderful. Absolutely, let me just stop sharing and over to you. And here we go. So Mathematics 2020. I'm Barb Seaton, and as Kim already mentioned, I'm from Fair Chance Learning. And at Fair Chance, we really do believe that all students, whether are, there are many as many to our most seasoned educator, we all deserve the best that we can be and, and to achieve that. So um, a little bit more about us. We think we, we like to know that, um, suggest that we are knowledge and thought mobilizers. We are all about building community, really want to be inclusionary. And so a land acknowledgement before we go too much further down this road. Um, as I mentioned earlier, I'm Barb and I come from a long a group of longtime farmers from Oxford County. And um, we've been living here for many, many decades and centuries and my family continues being stewards of the land with using um, good farming practices and my son is an arborist so he lovingly takes care of not only the trees in our neighborhood but in many many neighborhoods and I'd like to honor the Anishinaabe and the Attawandaran and the Mississauga who were the original caretakers of this land and I'd like you to take a moment to honor the caretakers of the land from which you were joining us as well and as you're honoring them I'd like you to think a little bit about how we can make this land acknowledgement piece more meaningful for our students and for ourselves as well. And as always, um, a step towards reconciliation is acknowledgement. Oh, nice. And so the new curriculum. So it's not so new anymore because we've had it since, oh gosh, way back last spring when everybody had nothing on their minds to do except thinking about the new curriculum. So it's asking us to um, explore the beauty of mathematics with students. It's talking about in establishing an inclusive learning environment so that everyone can see themselves in the math and, and see what they're bringing to the table as being valued. 
um, that leads us to incorporating student learning. And rather than looking at our students and seeing them as vessels to fill up with knowledge, they have stuff rolling around in there. And it's our job to pull that out and help them consolidate their understanding. And it's really all about helping our students seeing themselves in the math that's being taught and seeing themselves as math people. And, and in that being a math person, we want to help them foster that positive sense of math agency and identity. And that whole thing about around the beauty of mathematics, years and years and years ago, I was lucky enough to go to a conference and Ron Lancaster was there and he's talking about math trails and looking at the math around us. And he's been telling us for years to be looking at the beauty of math around us and making it more explicit to students so that they can appreciate the math that's in the real world. So it's not something I take from nine to 10 and forget about the rest of the time, but it's something that I use all the time. And my center picture is a, a picture of a, a scratch program, and it was created by Lu, Lu, Luigi Sorbana, and he's a basketball statistician and an application developer, and he created this little program in scratch, and it, high, it sort of brings to mind math in sports. So the program reads the data as related to 100 shots that Steph Curry took over two seasons, and then it plots it out on this basketball sketch in the background of scratch and the other is like so what can we learn from this what can we extrapolate from this visualization of data and, and bringing into that whole data piece and then i had to sneak in a picture of a lovely sunflower that i took a few weeks ago because the sunflower is just a one of many representations of the fibonacci sequence that we find in nature and a great a great place to start a dialogue with kids where else can we see the interesting fibonacci sequence the new curriculum says that math is integral to every aspect of our daily life, social, economic, cultural, and environmental. It's part of the human story. And today, mathematics continues to be found all around us. So there's ways that we can help kids really see where this math is. So let's dig a little deeper. So here we are, the new curriculum organized into strands with the social emotional learning skills and the mathematical processes overarching the other five strands. So the social emotional learning skills emphasizes student developing a sense of themselves as a mathematician and establishing their mathematics mathematical well-being and that's a quote from Chris Sertam who was doing um, several presentations on the curriculum over, over the last few weeks. Um, the seven processes are new to us the problem solving, reasoning, proving, reflecting, connecting, communicating, representing, selecting tools and strategies. That, that's not new. But as a former math learning coordinator, I knew that teachers saw that stuff at the front of the curriculum as maybe, maybe something I'll read when I get to it. And not that often do they get to it. We're kind of wrapped up in those specific expectations. So now the mathematical processes in SEL are overarching all the specific expectations. And I think they're being being brought a little bit more to the forefront. So number, the number strand is going is focusing on a variety of numbers, whole, fractions, decimals, integers, rational numbers, and more importantly, how they behave when operations are applied to them. The strand, it's built all around the ideas of number sense, flexible thinking, automaticity, mental math skills, and more importantly, what those skills look like across the grades. So it's not something that we learn just in grade three and four, but we're using that mental math and the um, automaticity all through the grades. Algebra. So the, in the algebra strand, students are going to be developing reasoning by working with patterns, variables, expressions, equations, inequalities, and more. And coding something new to our Ontario curriculum. Many teachers have been working coding into their math program for years, but now we actually, it's okay. But what coding is um, important for is because it actually teaches our kids to think and to problem solve. And it really allows our children to be um, producers rather than consumers of technology. Another new piece of our curriculum is mathematical modeling. It also lives under algebra. And it, there are no specific expectations. 
that the idea being that all students from all grade levels can uh, be involved in mathematical modeling. And mathematical modeling really links math and authentic real world questions. And it differs from problem solving in that the modeling is iterative and it's cyclical and it can change and flex with the addition of new data to the information. So you may have an idea at the start, but then when you know, learn something new, so things are going to change a little bit. It's really interesting. I really like this conversation I found on Twitter that Mark Chubb st started. And um, he was like, so what's this mathematical modeling problem? It's, you know, what's the biggest concern? What's new about this? And I love how Miriam Small said that, you know, mathematical modeling is more about, it's all about those really messier problems that aren't going to fall neatly into one strand or another, but maybe be a mashup of several strands and possibly fall over into your social studies as well. And it's more overtly about the need to make some evaluative assumptions. So all the information is not going to be there that you need to solve this problem. You're gonna to have to make some assumptions. And, and that makes people on, you know, a little bit, eh, because there's, maybe more than one possible right answer, depending. And she says, it's more about the process than the actual concept and the content that you're working on. Okay, so data. Wow, data is so important in this world of ever-changing ways and our data is growing exponentially by the moment. We really, really need our students to have some data literacy. And this strand is going to help our kids um, analyze and synthesize and be able to understand, generate and use data. And spatial sense. Spatial sense, um, well, number as well, but many of our new strands reflect recent research in the field. And spatial sense is reflecting the research all around findings around the integration of geometry, location and movement and measurement. So now they're all living under the spatial sense strand and really addressing that whole idea of spatial reasoning and how we can grow our spatial reasoning over time. And I always, I kind of chuckle when I hear the financial sense one. We're big CBC listeners at our house. And every morning on the news, I hear about how terrible the economy in Canada is and how much at debt everyone is. And I'm like, man, if we worked on this spatial or this financial sense a little more, maybe I wouldn't have to hear that every morning. So I'm glad to see it's here and it was alive and well before, but now it's more purposeful. Okay, so the whole new digital curriculum has been uh, designed to help teachers help themselves to understand the curriculum. So to learn more about the math that they teach. So by clicking, so I'm looking at a grade two coding expectation and we're gonna compare the grades. So if I click on compare grades, then I can see the grade before me and I can see where they're heading next year. So maybe I'm not sure, what are they supposed to know when they get to me? I can see at a glance what happened before and I can see where I'm sending them. So a nice mini continuum. But if I wanna go deeper, so for example, you know, coding is new to our curriculum. There's gonna be a few gaps and I'm going to have to, if I'm teaching grade seven, um, coding expectations, I'm going to have to go further back than just grade six, I'm going to have to probably head way back to grade one, so that I can meet those needs. And this continuum of looking through grades one to eight, it allows a teacher to see how is this concept developing as you go through the years. So we start with this in grade one, basically with coding, by the time we get to seven and eight, we're really using all of the aspects of coding and refining our code and becoming more, um, more finessed with our code. Whereas in the lower grades, we're still learning the bits of the code so that we can keep it rolling. So we can use those continuums to help us. As we keep drilling down, you'll notice that for each of the expectations, they also have included those transferable skills. So those of us who are thinking 21st century learning and helping our kids become better 21st century citizens, what's coding going to help me with? Well, critical thinking and problem solving, communication, digital literacy. And if we drill further, we look at some specific expectations, you'll notice that they have the number and then the expectation and then teacher supports. So the teacher supports are there to help you really understand what is this expectation trying to get across. We drill deeper. It comes in key concepts, 
describes key concepts, so has some notes. So the key concepts, um, in this instance, I'm looking at grade two coding. So it's trying to explain the difference between sequential and concurrent events. So I can look at my key concepts, pick those out. That will help me understand in my, in, for me, so I can help my kids understand better. And then you'll notice that in some instances, you'll get a note as well. In this case, the note is supporting the development of deeper understanding of mathematical concepts. So we're not coding just to code, but we're coding with a purpose. So for my minis, I using it to help them understand the commutative property. Two plus three is the same as three plus two. So if I step forward th two steps and then three steps more, it's the same as starting out with three steps and then two steps, I still place. I understand that the ministry is also working on more supports we speak. So keep coming back to the curriculum and checking in because there's more coming all the time. Another great support of the digital curriculum is that oftentimes you'll see words that have like a little dotted line underneath of them. And that is a key to you. It's a clickable glossary. So for example, I clicked on sequential events and then up pops my little glossary set of instructions carried out after another, usually top to bottom or right to left, on, etc. And if there's more, I see more. Um, on the curriculum website, you'll see that there are also some resources that are here for you to access as well. If you haven't read the high impact practices, I suggest that you dive into it. Fabulous documents supporting all great things to support your mathematical teaching. The key changes document is a great one, great place to start if you're just in a rush and wanna know, well, last year I taught grade five, what's different this year? That's a great place to start. And then finally, long range plans. So recently the ministry launched some long range plans for you to access and they are by grade band. So there's one to three, four to six, seven to eight. And they're sorted in two different ways. They're organized by question and they're organized by topic. So by question, they're all organized around um, and find questions. And each question usually involves several strands and draws on some big mathematical ideas like quantity, change, equivalence, dimension. And often the same question will span the grades. So it'll be the same question for grades four, five, and six, if that works. So most times is that's the way it is. And that's awesome for our combined grade teachers. So you're all kind of hitting the same mark at the same time. Organized by topic, the expectations have been clustered around a topic to support students in making those connections within those clusters and really breaking down those silos that we used to see in mathematics. So the topics are ordered to create a flow of learning and that's to help strengthen student understanding. And in turn, the learning can be expanded upon and applied in other topics. And because we have a new curriculum and we're going from reporting on four or five strands to one math mark, um, there was a video webinar a few weeks ago that talked about the growing success mathematics addendum and how that's going to affect the lives of teachers. So if you missed that, um, there is how you can um, access that in your own, on your own time and learn what the changes mean for you in the teaching world. And that brings me pretty much to the end. And if you have more questions or want some more information about the curriculum and how this may affect, these changes might be affecting you, don't hesitate to reach out. I'm at Barb underscore Seton on Twitter and Barb at fairchancelearning.com. And Kim, I'm going to stop sharing and turn it back to you. Great, thank you, Barb. I'm gonna turn my camera back on. I'm going to share my screen. Just checking that everybody can see my screen over here. Yes. Okay, perfect. Okay, great. So for this portion, um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to walk you through one of the eight courses which are included in our math course pack. So for this example, I chose the grade three course because it is the one that we've had approved for the Trillium list. 
And I'm going to break it down into a couple of parts. I'm going to show you um, all of the teaching material that's included in a co uh, course in the course pack for teachers to access. And then I'm going to go into uh, the counting unit and I'm just going to pick the first lesson and I'll walk you through an example of a lesson just to give you the general flow and then you'll have a solid understanding of how each lesson within each unit um, kind of breaks down. Um, I'll dive into quickly the assignments, the quizzes and the class progress tool too, just to kind of show you how it's integrated throughout the um, the Brightspace environment. I just wanted to remind everyone that we will try to save some time at the end for a quick Q&A. So if you do have questions, make sure to type them in the Q&A box um, in Zoom, and then we'll try to answer as many of them at the end of the webinar as possible. So I'm going to dive in here. Um, so to access the teaching material, I'm going to click on the introduction unit. And you can see here that we've got a whole lesson called teacher resources and that it's been hidden from our students. So to click in here, um, I'm just gonna highlight a couple of things. I won't go too in depth, but the first thing is a course outline. This is gonna give you an, um, an overview of the overall expectations covered throughout the course. Some of the required materials that you'll need, regular household items for students who are working remotely um, or some materials that you might need if you're using this resource with your students in class. Next, we've got our FAQs. So this kind of gives you a breakdown of some of the, um, the general questions that we get about the resource. Namely, it calls out the, the total numbers of assessments of learning and the total assessments for learning that are included throughout the resource. So you can see that we've got 19 assessments of learning and 82 assessments for learning. The math specific course elements um, are how we really addressed a couple of things. First of all, we wanted to give um, teachers the ability of capturing assessment as learning. So as you'll see these blue call out boxes included throughout the resource, they're always in blue. There's a couple different examples of them. And they're telling students to go outside of the learning environment to complete an activity. And we wanted to include these outside of the learning environment because it's really important for students to develop their fine motor skills and actually put pen to paper to complete some of these activities. They can take a photo of the activity and upload it, whether it's in the assignments tool or the portfolio tool tool just so that teachers can kind of touch base and see how students are doing as they're learning new concepts. Um, especially with our math talk. So we've got plugs, we've got our math talks, which is um, a call out bo box getting students to think and reflect about their learning, um, as well as our reflect and write pieces where again we're asking students to reflect or talk through um, different mathematical concept maybe with a math, math coach or their teacher or with a peer. Um, but this is really how we're uh, addressing that social emotional learning strand that is so integral to this new curriculum. So again, these are included throughout the resource assessment as learning, developing fine motor skills and, and hitting that social emotional learning outcome. In terms of the assessment for and of learning, um, so our assessments for learning will appear at the end of every single lesson. And once I dive into the student facing content, I'll show you an example of what that looks like. But they always appear in gray and it can be one of two components. It's either a quiz that students can take in the quizzes tool in Brightspace. It's graded automatically for the teacher or it can be an assignment which often is a PDF document that uh, students will have to open. If they don't have access to a printer, they, um, there is a workaround to complete this activity in a math journal, take a picture of it and submit that as opposed to filling out the PDF. Again, it was very important to us for our resource to be equitable. So we wanted to provide that workaround for teachers and for students. Now our assessments of learning will appear at the end of every single unit. Um, they will summarize and evaluate everything that students would have learned in the, in a, over the entire unit and they always appear in red. And they, these are two part um, evaluations. So there's a quiz, which uh, will be called a test, but it's done in the quizzing tool in Brightspace. And then there's that assignment component designed to be done outside of the learning environment that students can upload their answer in the assignments tool. The last thing I'm gonna show you is um, the teaching guide. So this is a PDF document included. Uh, there's a different one for each grade. So the grade three uh, guide is over 100 page lo pages long. And here's an example of one lesson 
outline that's um, provided in the teacher guide. So you can see that we cover everything from the expectation that's covered, the learning goal that we're achieving, what students should know, what they're learning and what they will learn, the different skills that they're going to need to apply, prompting questions, how to differentiate, whether it's making it easier or more challenging. If there is a printable, it's called out here so you'll know in advance. Um, any materials that would be required to complete this, and then any solutions if, um, if that was included in the activity. So that makes up the teaching resources. Now I'm gonna dive into our counting unit. So every single unit starts with an introduction where we introduce students to a different theme that'll, that we'll come back to throughout the unit. And this is just a way, especially with the younger students, to keep them in, um, engaged and involved with the material. So we can see here that for our counting unit, we're using an under the sea theme. Um, and we're using some characters that are introduced in our introduction to help tell the storyline as we work through everything. Diving into the first lesson, we can see all of the modules that are included in this lesson. And every single lesson will start with, um, uh, with an activity uh, where teachers can get students engaged in the content. So for this example, we're saying while watching an under the sea video, Sylvia heard a number. 50. What do you think that number could be describing? So whether you're teaching a synchronous class with your students and you want to get them discussing and sharing ideas or typing into a discussion board, or if in you're in front of your students in a classroom and you want to get them talking about it, just a, a quick little activity to, to hook them. Um, and then, of course, we identify a learning goal. So once we've, we've um, identified a learning goal, we, dive, we then move into a skill drill. So this is designed to review skills that students would have learned either earlier on in the course or in an earlier grade, but they're going to need to apply to this lesson. So here's an example of one of those blue call out boxes where we can apply an assessment as learning. Um, and we're asking students to start at one and count by ones to 100. And then we give them a little solution here where they can um, check their own understanding. You can ask students to record themselves doing this uh, using the, the features in the assignments tool. Um, however you want, want to get them to interact with this content. Next, we move into a warm up. Now, this is always an interactive activity inside of the learning environment for students to interact with. They can do it as many times as they want. Um, and it, again, it, we're just warming up the skills that they're going to need to apply to the lesson that's coming. So this is a bingo game. We're asking students to read a number and then find the corresponding numeral. Um, if they get it wrong, no problem. They can keep trying again. They're trying to get a bingo. Um, and again, it's just a fun way for them to interact with the math content and start warming up some of the skills that are coming. If they find this challenging, we do provide some helpful hints for them um, that they can, they can practice as well. So once we've warmed up all of our skills, we then kind of move into the new concept that's being introduced. introduced sorry. Uh, so here we're looking at reading and writing numbers up to 100. You, you see that using that under the sea theme, we're talking about different animals that might make up numbers between one and 100. Um, and then we kind of break down, okay, counting by 20s. Here's some, some examples of, of, of counting to 20. Um, we're asking students, we're providing teachers with prompting questions that they can ask students. So when you write the numbers 20 to 29, what do you see? The, the numbers in the tens place always stays two. The numbers in the ones place increment um, increases by one. When you write the numbers, what do you see? So again, we're getting students to think and reflect about what they're learning. We provide an audio recording for them to listen to as well. Um, and we provide the same activity all the way up to 100. And then we also do a, a consider this where we're asking students to think about the patterns about what they're learning as well. So again, just trying to apply and reflect upon what they're learning instead of just memorizing numbers. Once we've introduced that, we then move into, you know, where do we see these numbers in everyday life? We think it's really important for students to understand why they're learning the things that they're learning. So for example, if they're watching television, where might they see the number 64 or two o'clock? 
Um, so just another fun interactive for students to work through and something that teachers can do with students as well to help lead discussions. Um, and then again, we move into, okay, in a real world example, here are some, some areas where um, in an under the sea theme, you know, there might be a hundred different species of fish. There could, the water might be between 23 and 29 degrees Celsius. Um, and then when I grow up, if I wanted to be a marine biologist, where, here, here are some places where I might come up to these um, encounter numbers between one and a hundred. So once we've introduced all of these core concepts, we then start to, um, to practice the skills that we've learned. So here's another unplug designed to be done outside of the learning environment where we're getting students to look in a newspaper or on the internet and, and call out numbers and, and find numbers between 10 and 100. Um, and then we also do some practice questions here for them as well. So there's an audio clip with somebody saying a number and then we're asking students to, to write these numbers out. Let's practice is always followed up with that's a wrap. So we summarize what we've learned and we recap our learning goal and then uh, for, the, for the lesson. And then we move into the assessment of learning. So this is one of those PDF assessments uh, that students can download. Once they complete it, they would just click on the next page and then click to go to the assignments tool. Real quick, diving into the assignments tool just to get, show you what's included. Anything that is listed as an AFL is one of those end of lesson um, assessments for learning. Um, they are not associated with the grade book. Anything that is a unit assessment, so that red assessment of learning that occurs at the end of the unit is associated with the grade book. You can see that um, the grade associated item is there. Teachers have full flexibility on whether or not they use these, how much of this they use, um, they can add their own assessments, anything that they want to do. This is just how we present it to them. And once they get it, it's totally up to them to customize it based on the needs of their students. Likewise, in the quizzing tool, we see that anything that's uh, called an AFL is one of those assessments for learning. It is not linked to the grade book, but anything that is called to test has that grade associated item with them, um, associated with it. Um, all of these assessment or these quizzes can be edited. So you can add questions, take questions away, totally customizable, or you can decide not to use them at all um, and create your own assessments if that's what you decide. Last but not least, before I uh, bring in Naomi, here is our class progress tool. Um, so this classroom, it's a, just a demo classroom. I've enrolled myself as a student and I just wanted to show how, um, how teachers can use the content to make informed teaching decisions based on students, how students are interacting with it. So we saw a number of assignments and quizzes and, um, and let's say Kim either did really, really well or really, really poorly. We can actually dive into how Kim interacted with this content to see, um, to, see to, to inform our teaching approach. So here uh, in our content, we can see that she's visited 26 topics um, within here. Just let me wait for this page to load. Oh, I clicked on the wrong thing, bear with me. Click right here. So in the counting unit, we can see that Kim has completed 24 of 113 um, modules. And by clicking on these drop down menus, we can actually drill down and say, see how long Kim interacted with each piece of content. And we can see the assessment for learning that was included as well. So let's say Kim did really, really well, but she's only spending 12 or 37 seconds interacting with this content. As a teacher, I may know, hey, you know what? Kim's not being challenged enough. I'm gonna push her a little bit more. I'm gonna push some content that's a little bit more challenging her way. On the flip side, maybe Kim's spending 10 minutes on each one of these sections and she's still not performing well. Well, you know what? Maybe there's a learning gap and I can use this to, to either plan another synchronous um, or, or, or class um, lesson around this topic, or 
um, maybe I just want to push some content to this specific student to help address that gap and bring them up to speed. So just the way that the content is integrated throughout Brightspace, we can use a lot of the reporting features that are already included um, to identify and address a lot of these learning gaps. I know I said that this was the last thing, but I am going to mention one more thing here before I uh, bring in Naomi. So I'm just going to reload the content tool. Um, a lot of teachers have really great teaching approaches and in no way, shape or form is any kind of a resource ever going to replace the role of a teacher. So I did want to call out that although this content is provided for teachers, it is 100% customizable. You can hide and unhide as much content as you want. You can use the assessments if you want or not. You can add content that you've already created in another one of your courses from a previous year or create brand new content. You can link to external resources if you really want to supplement a lesson with your students. You can change the order of these. You can delete it. It's totally up to you. Um, we, we really wanted to provide quality content to teachers to help them address the new math curriculum, but it was equally important for us to make them able to accommodate and adapt and customize that resource based on the specific needs of their students. So with that being said, I'm going to stop sharing my screen and I'm going to invite Naomi Weller to join. Um, Naomi, if you can unmute yourself and turn on your camera. And uh, just as a brief introduction, as Naomi gets up and running. So Naomi is a teacher in the Hamilton Wentworth District School Board. Her board had the opportunity of piloting our math content over the course of the summer uh, when they were running remote summer school uh, programs. And Naomi was one of the teachers who had access. So I wanted to invite Naomi uh, just so that she can share some of her experiences around using the math content um, and, and really kind of give you a, a, a hands-on idea of, of some different strategies for how you could incorporate this, this content, whether you're teaching remotely, whether you're teaching just in class, or if you're one of those teachers who are now teaching both remote and blended students. Hopefully. Hi, Kim. <laughs> Hi, Naomi. So, First question for you. So you did have the chance to pilot the content over the course of the summer. The first thing I want you to do is um, would ask for you to do is to kind of speak to the quality of the and the thoroughness of the resource from your perspective compared to some of the other uh, resources that you had told me about that you were that you had accessed. Yeah, well, um, as as some of you could probably see the the visuals are fantastic um, teachers, we spend a lot of time um making anchor charts and finding pictures and within uh this math content the visuals are there and clear um the resource is so comprehensive i see lots of people saying where can we get this it, um it's so comprehensive i it's kind of like one-stop shopping everything is is there for you um listed and you can just click through um when Kim and I talked in the summer, um, after I had a chance to use this, what I had said to her was, um, a resource like this allows me to focus on my teaching. It allows me to focus on my instruction. I can be a good teacher because I have the resources that I need um, right at my fingertips. Um, so many of us are scrambling around and pulling from the, this binder and this resource and um, buying things online. Uh, where this kind of puts everything together in a really streamlined, uh, streamlined way. Awesome. Anything else, or do you want to move on to the next question? Um, I well, I, I I mentioned this a little bit later. I will mention this a bit later, but um, just the idea that you can go through, you know, where your students are, and um, you can kind of go through some of those steps that you showed there to to make sure you're finding the best place. Um, for your students. Um, but yeah, I think the, the next question. Okay, awesome. Um, I'm just going to dive in just a, a uh, So Naomi piloted the content. I did speak with a, a number of other teachers. Some of them talked about um, were brand new to Brightspace had never used it before. So they didn't have established courses. And they just said the amount of time that they saved from having to set up their course and find content 
build out content, make that content engaging, make sure they were hitting learning expectations, using that content to address gaps, just the amount of time it saved by having at least they described it as like a spine for their course that they could follow. And then they only had to worry about pulling in pieces of content to supplement if there was a learning gap or if there was, you know, a lesson that they just loved using, um, they could really focus on those sorts of things. So just the, the amount of time to get up and running. Huge time saver, because as you, when we talked in the summer, we were um, teaching remotely in like a, a gap closing camp for the summer for HWDSB. And, you know, many of us were like, what are we going to teach? What are we going to do? Um, and then when this was, this course was part of our content in the hub, it was like, um, a, a huge lifesaver. Perfect. So I saw a question from for Hannah in um, in the chat or, or just a comment, and she, uh, she said, you know, are students expected to work on the content independently? Although it can, and, and that I found that that was a nice transition to my next question. So can you share um, with everybody how you used um, how you use the resources to actually kind of guide and, and your synchronous instruction. And, and you, you had mentioned uh, the potential of kind of running us through a sample lesson. Right. So um, I think that's a really good question because that was when I, when I looked at it, I, I first wasn't sure how to use it. And then when I started presenting the lessons as you kind of did, and I, I can do that in a minute, um, I, um, I was able to kind of do a combination of both. Um, and I, I tended to um, upload some of the questions in other ways um, that I found that my families uh, were able to access. And I think that's really important when you're teaching remotely that even though it might be set up a certain way, like you said, as a teacher, you can mix and match and change and use the resource the way that best works with, with what you're doing. Um, so do you want to go through one now? Or? Yeah, sure. Why don't you share your screen and kind of walk us through a sample lesson? Um, and then if I've got follow up questions, I can ask that. Kim, can I hear that question one more time? The one that you would ask the, do you remember what that last question was? Uh, I'm just going to scroll back up. Uh, I'm trying to see it. The chat's going wild. Uh, <laughs> Which is a great thing. I'm not sure if I fully answered it. Are students expected to work on the content independently? Right. Um, yeah, and I, I think that using technology, especially for younger children, can be challenging. And so as a teacher, adjusting the content, um, changing the format a little bit, tweaking things here and there um, is, t is totally fine. Um, I'll, I'll show you a little bit um, about our, how I used uh, the resource synchronously. Um, so I'm going to share the screen a bit. And Kim, if it's really slow, I might need you to grab something and show it because. Well, if, you, if you're worried, I can just do it now if you remind me the lesson. Okay, so in the grade one. Yep. Uh, I'll share my screen now. In showing numbers to 50. So this is counting unit showing numbers to 50? Yes, yeah. Counting. And I know some people before had asked some questions about where is the introduction and where are certain certain things. Oh, sorry, it's in the numbers. Oh, sorry about Just that. Showing numbers up to 50. Okay, yeah. And um, so what I usually do, um, or what I was doing in the summer was I'll, I'll look through a lot of the components of that lesson just to see where my students are. Um, and if I think, if I already know something's going to be too easy, I, I just skip that part and go to the next. Um, so I think if you click on the warm up, so you can see some of the great visuals um, that I was mentioning. Um, and if I'm doing this synchronously, I'm doing, I'm walking my students through this and we're answering together um, and they really enjoy it. Um, and you can see there are a few examples there that, you know, it's kind of like a multiple choice that you're doing together. And I think that if you are really tech savvy and your families are really tech savvy, 
you might be assigning this for students to go through independently, but you don't have to. Um, and one of the, the notes I had made was, um, you may display something like this, uh, whether you're teaching remotely or in the classroom, and then ask your students to um, say you're teaching remotely, here's a picture of um, 11 counters, let's stop for a minute, go around your house, find 11 pennies or 11 toys, whatever it is, and line them up and do it just like you see here. Um, and in the classroom, using, uh, I've, I often get the kids to use a whiteboard um, or their counters right at their desk when I'm teaching math. And I think that's a great way to tie in what you're seeing on the screen um, to practical sort of like hands-on activities for students. So I don't know how much time we have, Kim, or what? Yeah, we've got, we've got plenty of time. Do you want me to go to the next module? Yeah, um, I think down to the raw, I was, um, yeah, I'm just looking there is, can you stay in the numbers for a second? Sorry, mm -hmm. I'm just looking for the one that said, oh, there it is, showing the numbers with rods and units. Oh, showing numbers. It's just down to you. Down here. So I don't know but it, about um, other teachers out there, but I, I really think place value is um, so important for students to under, have a good solid math understanding. Um, and this one is a great one to start talking about what is a, a one or what is a unit and what is a rod or a 10. Um, and then again, either I think synchronously in classroom teaching can be very similar that you might look at some of these visuals, go through the lesson, and then ask students to, uh, in, in the summer, actually, I did this with uh, place value. The kids went and found like things around their house to represent a 10 and a one. Um, and it was lots of fun. And I think as Barb was talking about earlier, it really made the math um, real. Um, and then I think this one has a video there, which I think is amazing because I mean teachers you know were like you know on YouTube and finding trying to find a video here that's just the right thing to teach whatever lesson whereas this everything is um, everything is lined up this goes with the lesson perfectly um, and I, I don't know if you want to play the video but the um, the videos are, are really good too uh, let's see and Kim the um, Comparing numbers up to 50 was also, um, I think, I'm trying to think where, yeah, just down there. This one? Yeah, and I'm trying to think. So you could click on this, the skill drill there. Oh, sure. So when I was looking at this one, um, you showed one earlier also that has sound. These ones do too. So um, most of my students are quite familiar with numbers one to 10, but some of them need some more work with 11 to 20. So um, when you click on those, the numbers come up and you can hear the counting and you can have students again online or in the classroom doing very similar things, writing the numbers out, creating a number line where you're just sort of, um, drawing on practical application to go along with the lesson so the students aren't just sitting watching a screen. Um, I know that totally saved me with remote teaching was the go find me this. Let's we're doing this. Let's now we're going to to get a piece of paper and write it out or find counters to match what you see on the screen. So I really liked uh, this one. And then if you go to the warm up, There were great visuals here again to show which this is such a, a difficult concept for kids. And I just really loved these. We used to showed some of these before where you're clicking through in the kids, which is more, which is less. And the vocabulary here, and I can't remember if it was just down here where it talks again about the words fewer and less. Um, and students are able to look at the pictures and respond. Teaching remotely, they can be writing the word in the chat. The parrots are there are more parrots, less tigers, whatever it is. And then I think it was the, um, 
which is bigger. And that'll be the last one um, that I just thought was fantastic. If you scroll, okay, so it's talk, this concept is so difficult and the way that it's laid out here, I just thought was amazing. Um, kids will be able to say easily, well, 12 is bigger than nine, no problem. But as you scroll down, this video, and I don't know if you want to play it or not, but. Um, there can be sound issues playing video. Okay, over well, if it doesn't work, but just, it's a short video, it's to the point. And um, I don't know, I just thought it was fantastic, but it might be nice to for people to see a video if it works. Sure. What a beautiful day to play a game of basketball. A group of kids have organized themselves into two teams. Which team has more players? To find out, let's learn how to compare numbers by matching each player on the team as we count. One, two, three, four. There is one more player on team one, but there isn't another player on team two to match. Anyway, I don't know if you want to play this something, means but. More um, on team one than on team. All right. I didn't know if you wanted to keep playing the whole thing. Just, I don't know how much time we have, but just that it was, um, I don't know, just a really well put together lesson. I'm not sure if you guys could hear the audio, but I did turn on the closed captioning, which is one of the many accessibility features included throughout these resources so that you could follow around with the tech or with the text. All right. um, and so one more question that I did want to mention. Um, so uh, Naomi, before I answer a question, was there anything else that you wanted to mention? Um, oh, one more question I had for you actually. Um, you shared some really great um, I'll stop sharing here. Uh, some really great anecdotes about using portfolio in your classroom, which is separate from our math resources, just one of the features of Brightspace um, to capture student learning. So can you talk a little bit more um, about how you're incorporating portfolio in the classroom? Yeah, and I, I love it. I started using uh, portfolio during the school closure period. Um, and I'm, I'm using it back in the classroom as well um, to, and I think the, the resource that you just showed um, gives lots of opportunities where students can, you know, maybe using the work that's provided there. We didn't see too many examples of those, but they're fabulous as well. Um, or those sort of demonstration tasks that I was talking about where kids um, maybe line up counters in groups of five. And then as the teacher, you're taking a photo of it um, and using the QR codes. If it weren't for privacy, I'd show you, but I've got them all on the student desks right now um, with the Brightspace app. And I'll just click on the class, then take a photo of their work. And the, the work is, there's a picture of the work now in the, in the, the virtual portfolio. And I can comment on it and share it with parents so that I don't have to send paper home now. I mean, I you know, the odd time I will, but I know many people might be concerned about that. But then you have this digital portfolio that parents can see. Um, and as a teacher, you can put feedback um, and parents can read that and even do follow up work. Um, at, like if you're teaching remotely um, and when I was teaching um, from March to June, I would comment right into all the work on portfolio and then parents were able to um, make corrections with their children or um, maybe do a follow-up task. But I think that uh, portfolio ties in so well with this content. Love it. <laughs> so we did have a question from, another question from Farhana um, who asked if students are struggling, can we have access to earlier grades? Um, so, um, to answer that question, the way that the court, so we work, we work with school boards and directly with school boards because this content lives on the board's um, instance of Brightspace and they, they pass it out. So if you're a grade teacher, you would be given access to the grade three content. However, we understand it's really important to be able to flex the content based on the needs of your students. So in the setup, we do enable teacher to pull content from other grades to either address learning gaps or help meet the needs of accelerated students who are just performing above and beyond. Uh, one, one last question for you, and then we'll turn it over to the full Q&A. Um, is just any big differences between how you use 
Brightspace and the math content in an in-class environment versus remote. I know that teachers struggle with that, that transition. So any way that you could help guide teachers with, with that transition? I, I think the remote piece maybe has that idea of work submission because I don't, I don't see a lot of differences. Like I, I find now teaching in the classroom, I am still using my Google Slides slide deck the way that I taught remotely. Um, so the visuals are, are now mostly on the screen. And I mean, I still make the odd chart and think chart, uh, but it's very similar. But remote teachers have this piece of the work, the work. Um, and I, you know, I think uh, the math has the you have the assignments, and I think you briefly showed that where students can complete work there um, with marking and feedback, and it's all um, listed. And it's just making sure that families know how to access that technology. That was, I think. And I, without having other people interact now with me to say, I would imagine a lot of family or teachers would say that as well, that they maybe know how to use the technology, but um, helping the families that they work with and the students to do that, that's, that's maybe the challenge. Um, but using those other aspects like portfolio in Brightspace and um, the, the assignments page that students are able to complete the work right, right there. Perfect. Okay. Well, I, uh, Lauren, I guess I uh, will turn it back over to you. I know that some questions came in from the Q&A and the chat. I haven't been able to keep track of all of them, uh, but if you want to um, address some questions to the group and, and we'll do our best to, to answer. Sure. Um, so the first question that I have is, does course content integrate with other subjects at grade level? Does it integrate with other subjects? So right now, the only content that we have is for math. We knew that the, um, Ontario was releasing a new math curriculum. We know that any new, any any time a new curriculum is released, there's a huge lift, and and teachers need support in, in implementing that curriculum. So that was our focus. Uh, so right now, there is just math. However. Uh, for next September, we are planning on expanding to other elementary subjects, including language, science, social studies, and a couple others. So it's not available yet, but it's coming. All right, that's good to hear. And then I think the resounding question that everyone wanted to know was, how about do we access this content? Absolutely. That's always the number one question. So right now, um, we are working with school boards across Ontario to get this uh, material for uh, their teachers. Um, right now, we only implement it at a board level. So if there is some, if you do want to um, have access to it, what I would recommend is once you get a copy of this recording, send it to your math consultant or your math coordinator um, and have them contact D2L at k12ont at d2l.com. Um, and then we can set up a call with them and we can work with them to make sure that we can get access um, for all teachers. So I'm gonna dump that email address into the chat and send it to everyone. I don't know if I can send a chat to all attendees, panelists and attendees, there we go. So please uh, contact us, uh, send that the recording of this webinar to your math co consultant. We will work with them and we will do our, our best to, to give access to as many teachers as possible. And yes, we, will, we are recording this and we are sending a copy of the recording out to all attendees. Any other questions there, Lauren? That was the last question, but just so everyone knows, I'm including a link to the D2L course packs webpage that you can share with your board um, or your math lead at your board. All right, well, if that's it, thank you everyone so much for your time today. Um, I hope that between Barb and Naomi and myself, we were able to provide some valuable take takeaways, uh, not only to help you implement the new math curriculum, um, but just to help integrate uh, Brightspace, whether you're teaching remotely or in class or both. Um, we will be sending around a recording, so, so um, I'm not sure on the turnaround time for that, but do uh, keep posted 
Um, and again, if you are interested in getting access to this content, we are deploying it board wide. So once you get a copy of this recording, forward it to your math consultant or your math coordinator um, and have them contact k12ont at d12.com if they're interested in learning more and we'll, uh, we'll schedule a meeting with them and, and make sure to get them as um, all set up. All right, thanks, Kim. And just a reminder, um, everyone will receive a copy of the recording to the email address that you um, registered for this webinar with in about three days. Thank you, have a good afternoon. Thanks everyone. Hi everyone, thank you.